Hello everyone, today I'm continuing my JDM journey of discovery with this gorgeous Mark IV Supra that the owner Jamie has kindly brought down to me. Now as you'll have seen from the title, yes, this is an automatic. It is also a genuine twin turbo car, so one out of two ain't bad. Now I'm here to find out two things. First off, is that automatic really the killjoy that the internet would have you believe? And more importantly, from the perspective of somebody that's never actually lusted after a Supra that much, just how good are they? I'll be honest, this car probably more than any other JDM car I really know very, very little about. So I'm not gonna pretend that I do. Instead, I'm gonna hop in the car with the owner, we're gonna take it out for a nice drive, and hopefully we'll see what we think. So, as promised, I have the car's owner, Jamie, joining me in the passenger seat today to do a couple of things. Biggest one, filling in the black hole that is otherwise my Supra knowledge. Now, Jamie is also a representative for Adrian Flux. Yes, so, and his job is basically working with all the kind of car clubs and yep. individual groups and things. So if you've currently got a modified or interesting or import or performance car and you need a bit of help, like maybe comment in the video or something, I'm sure he can get in touch and help you out. Driving this Supra, a couple of first things that I notice. Number one, the gearbox is very, very predictable and very, very easy to use. It's only got four speeds, not really very many by anyone's definition, but you know what it's doing. Driving around town, some older boxes, and you know, this is a 20 plus year old car, they're not always the easiest. I mean, you get really old automatic gearboxes and they can do things like stall which is something that a driver of a modern car would probably not even conceive as possible, but trust me, it is. However, pulling out of junctions and doing all that sort of stuff, it's very, very easy. And the other thing is that this car pulls really, really well. I haven't revved it out yet because I'm just getting a bit of a feel for it, but this car still has the original twin turbo setup and it's great. I loved the twin turbo setup in the RX-7 that I drove, and this one works brilliantly as well. Now this car is not very heavily modified at all. The differences over standard are the very nice split rim BBS wheels that you'll have seen in the exterior shots. And it's basically had a cap removed and some of the exhaust tarted around with, because as I understand it, the cars are restricted from factory in the exhaust. So this is from that golden era of Japanese cars where no matter what they did to them, they always made 276 horsepower. Honest, really, seriously. Now I think in the UK they actually were more honest and they advertised this as well, about 320? They were, yeah, yeah. So, but this car now makes about 370 and that's achieved simply through just removing a little bit of the restriction in the exhaust. Now, in the near future, this car is going to have a few more mods done to it, which are hopefully going to bring the power up to about 400, but from where I'm sat, it's not exactly lacking. It's also got BC Racing coilovers because the original Japanese spec ones broke, basically because the roads in Japan are considerably better than the country lanes that we have in England, and, you know, they gave up. Look, suspension components are a consumable item, so that's what happens. Otherwise, this is a standard car, right? Other, yeah, other than that, yeah. It's got the most amazing dash. I mean, I've heard before about the way Supras are, but actually, until today, I never, ever sat in a Supra. And you couldn't be in anything else. The way it's designed is just, it's bonkers. It's like, like it's like a fighter pilot. Yeah, That's what you're yeah, very, very uh, aeronautical inspired. If you look at like the vents and things, you can see the, uh, the, you know, aeronautical inspiration for it. Yeah, it's like propeller shaped. Yeah, that's quite cool. One of the coolest things in this car, though, without a doubt, is a little red thing down there. This car has, uh, you got it off eBay, the original spec Japanese roadside flare. It may still work. <laughs> it may work. We're not going to find that out because it may go horribly wrong and also we're going to hope we just don't need it. Well, so. the expiry date on it, it says 2002, so... Okay, all right, so <laughs> it's an old, it. old <laughs> Japanese flair. So, but, you know, there's something kind of cool about it. You've got the odd little bit of Japanese writing left in here, although not much. I think if you weren't paying attention, you wouldn't realise that this was an import. I've certainly seen other cars where they're... Um, 
somewhat confusing, let's say, when it comes to the interior. Uh, 944 convertible. You don't see that very often. No, you do not. Sunday today and everyone seems to have come out to uh, play with whatever they've got to play with including unfortunately a lot of farm traffic which we were stuck with earlier today but I'm hoping on these roads we're uh, not going to have too much of that. This car's got double wishbone suspension in front and rear something I really really like. If you want to know why that's such a good thing ask engineering explained. I could give half an explanation but I'm not going to. Suffice it to say this is the same setup that's used on my Evora and on a McLaren. There's a reason it's used. It's very, very good. The steering in here is quite light. Not too much feel through it. You know, I saw something funny online the other day. I saw someone listing the Supra as an example of one of the great all-wheel drive turbo <laughs> Japanese cars. And I just sort of thought, yeah, you haven't, haven't checked. I mean, I've done at least that amount of research. Like, yeah. So I think I think I never liked the Supra as much because obviously all my experience comes from playing Gran Turismo and when you needed to get those really good performance numbers, because the GTR had all wheel drive, when you you know made it a thousand horsepower, it was it was a lot easier to drive. Yeah. But the Supra being rear wheel drive was just a little bit wild. Which I'm sure a real thousand horsepower Supra probably is a bit leery. Yeah, um, but it so would be a a thousand horsepower GTR. Definitely, definitely. I think the main difference is that if you're aiming for a thousand horsepower, you can do it considerably cheaper and more reliably in the Supra mm. than the GTR. You know the um, uh, guy I went out drifting with in Spain, Freddy Asbo. His one of his drift cars is a GT86 with a 1100 horsepower 2JZ in it. Oh, okay. Yeah, it looks pretty awesome. Despite its age, this car feels very well put together. It's pretty solid. Look, now, the interior is classic 90s Jap car. And that's a good thing or a bad thing, really, depending on your perspective. I like it because, you know what? It couldn't be anything else. I particularly like the confetti-looking carpets, which remind me very much of the confetti Recaros in the Celica GT4, which I understand you could also have had as an option in these. Yes, you could, yeah. Uh, like the Celica, this is actually a 2 plus 2. Who's getting in the back? I really don't know, um, but I expect they, uh, they're probably going to be Asian in origin. It might even have been an insurance thing because actually um, 2 plus 2 is generally are cheaper on insurance than two-seaters. Yeah, that actually was. That's why a lot of Japanese um, car companies made 2 plus 2s rather than two-seaters, or at least had the option, for example, 300 ZXs. You could buy them as a two-seater or a 2 plus 2. Yeah. And it's because the Japanese companies could just sell, market them as a family vehicle, <laughs> and they got taxed less when they produced them than, yeah. than on a particular proper two-seater. Uh, Genuinely, the car of my own that I'm being most reminded of at the minute is my old BMW 6 Series. It's got that kind of effortlessness about it. So what I'm now going to do is I'm going to put the car into manual mode as we approach slightly more entertaining roads. Now yes, it's only got the four speeds. Now to do that, you press the button down here that says manual, you drop it out of overdrive, and then basically you can choose from first, second, third, and if you whack overdrive, it goes into fourth. Which you won't need to do unless you're going up to about 130 mile an hour. Fair enough. Is this car still limited? No. 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 than the manual Supras. I mean, the manual gearbox, yeah, can hold a thousand horsepower, etc., etc. but if you say you had a 500 horsepower example of each, the, the, the auto was quicker because the gears are longer and it shifts much faster than you can in the manual. And you're saying that drag racing people really like the these? The drag racing people really like these, and if they're really serious, they'll swap these out for like a, a two or a three-speed um, American made gearbox. Yeah, the Americans think it's all three-speed boxes, like, that's just what they go for. I'm just getting a feel for the car at the minute, just kind of working out along these roads. It's very pleasant. Actually, that gearbox is better than I thought it would be, you know. 
Uh, driven cars are a lot newer with a lot less sporty auto boxes. Oh, Mustang? Yeah. Everyone's out to play. Let's call this the uh, Essex Toge. Um, <laughs> this is a. Uh, this car's doing well. Now, one thing I'm currently wary of, and you know, if you guys are listening to the sounds of the engine, which I'm sure you are, you'll notice, is I'm currently not letting the car rev out too much. The reason for that being that my last experience of a twin turbo car was in the RX7. And I know when that second turbo kicks in, you do get. There's a moment of shove where you get a little bit extra boost as the second one comes in. And I don't yet know how that car behaves, or how this car behaves when that happens. So what I'm gonna do is get it into a nice straight line, then find out what it does, because I do not want to upset this lovely car in the middle of a corner. Right. Now, this car is a very interesting example. I was talking to Jamie earlier, and he's explained to me its sort of uh, lineage as well. Wow. There is the third 488 I have seen in three days. <laughs> they're everywhere. I'm not going to buy one because sure they're not, too common. Sure, it's not the same one you see. Mm, don't think so. Well, one of them was black. Oh, okay. So unless he plasti dipped it on Friday <laughs> and changed his mind, yeah, it's not the same car. So there was a pre facelift Supra and a facelift Supra, but this one sits kind of in the middle. Yes. So it's it's actually a facelift. Yeah, so what it is, it's the very first month of when they were swapping over to the facelift design. So it's got the facelift interior, the facelift exterior stuff, um, but it hasn't got the proper VVTi, um, well, say it hasn't got the VVTi engine. I say proper, but really tuners prefer the non-VVTi engines because they're easy to tune, the parts yeah. more available for them, you can make bigger power on like stock internals, etc. Uh, and it doesn't have the, the Tiptronic uh, gearbox. Yeah. Um, which is just this gearbox, but a little bit faster. You've got buttons on the steering wheel to change your gears. Yeah. Um, but yeah, as I said, it has all the other stuff, but what is particularly interesting about this car is that it's in a pre-facelift colour, um, uh, Alpine Silver, which they discontinued for the, for the facelifts. Um, they changed to a much darker silver called Quicksilver. Yeah. So it turns out that um, this is actually one of only 71 twin-turbo uh, cars, um, face of cars in this colour. Worldwide? Worldwide, wow. yes. Um, that was the result of an evening's uh, searching on the super registry. <laughs> um, so is this a, was this a premium like colour when it was available or was it just a fairly standard? This is the second most common colour. Um, okay. The preface of cars, the most common is black. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I can't think of the last time I saw a super that wasn't silver. Yeah, interestingly, although well, those are the second most co common colour, the majority of the black ones did actually get, end up in the States. So this is the most common colour you see in Japan and uh, so in its home market and, and the UK yeah. markets. And these days, the well, I suppose always, the UK supermarket has been dominated by imports because you were saying there was only a few hundred ever yeah, officially but, imported. Yeah, proper UK spec cars. So. Certainly moves. That transition actually between the just the one turbo and the two is actually very smooth. I was quite impressed. It doesn't really. I can hear it. This car makes loads of noises. It, it, it sounds. I would think it actually almost sounds supercharged. You can hear that turbo kind of puffing away and it's doing yeah. its thing. It's yeah. It's nice. When we were doing our photos and stuff, we were talking about MR2s because you've got a two. Uh, MR2 as well, yeah. Obviously, my mate's got one and a half twos, <laughs> and I was talking about the fact that so yours is done off a track and, and, and stuff. Yes, and but actually, is in the process of being converted back to a road car. Yeah, and I think I see a lot of twos doing that. They go and people buy them as cheap track cars, but actually, having driven one that was in reasonably road spec, I think that they're they're calling like the thing they're actually best at is being like a little baby gt car because they're really comfy you can stick a lot of stuff in them and you know they're just actually really nice places to be which i don't think anyone expects a two to be like that everyone keeps talking about them like they're some sort of like cut price lotus elise and 
that's not what they are. Having owned an Elise, they are so far away from that, it's not even funny. Now, in terms of storage, this car's not brilliant because that boots very, very, very shallow. shallow yeah. um, very similar to, say, like the RX-7 or something like a Corvette. It's probably a bit more extreme than the Corvette, to be honest. Yeah. Um, so, a paper and poster salesman, you know, deflated Lilo salesman, that, that's great. Um, but I think realistically, if you're going away, you're probably going to put some soft overnight bags yeah. on the little back seats. But Toyota did know that and they made it, unlike the RX-7 I believe, um, you can fold the rear seats down completely flat so although it is shallow it does extend that That's much, handy. much further. Yeah. I mean I've gone um, camping in this. Um, really? Before. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, camping at a car show and uh, managed to fit, you know, two days worth of stuff, a couple of bags, a tent in there. You can, you can get, a, you know, a two sets of golf clubs in it, so. That's good. Not that I like golf. Um. It's not a, it's not at all a mad car at the top end. Like, I'd say, because this is what I suppose you have, 370 brake, 370 torque. Uh, about 320 torque. Only 320 torque, okay. Yeah. It feels talkier than that to me. Like, I think it feels really talky. It's because um, of how the turbos are, you actually get um, about 90% of torque um, below um, 4,000 RPM. So with just the one turbo just going? Just one turbo going, yeah. That's interesting, yeah, it doesn't, you know, some cars, so say like my Subaru, which is obviously just a single turbo setup, that doesn't get going, that doesn't do anything to like three grand, but then once it gets going, it races to that red line, whereas yeah. this actually, I'd say it's doing its best work in like, yeah, where that just that one turbo is going. So, and it'd be interesting to see how that changes when you then let the car have a little bit more boost. Because it's running now, we reckon, what, about 0.7 bar or Probably a bit more than that. Standard is supposed to be 0.7. I would have thought it's probably around 0.9 at the moment. Yeah. Um, once it's had the upgrades, it should be about 1.2. Thing. I actually don't really need to change gear like at all for the majority of the roads that I'm driving on right now because the car's got so much flexibility with that low down torque that you know it's not like something like a, an old Civic Type R where if you had if you had put this gearbox in that car you, you'd kill it stone dead oh, like, yeah. you just wouldn't go anywhere you'd, you'd hate the whole thing but this car isn't bothered it's got the torque to pull those gears and yeah I'm I'm enjoying the whole experience, really. Well, interestingly, I, I own a Civic Type R. That's my daily, and it's um, almost a bit of a. Whenever I switch in between the two, um, I'm used to driving the Civic, having to rev it out, and then I get into this, and uh, suddenly, you know, I'm only half putting my foot down, and I'm going as fast as I would be in the Civic, and it's. Uh, it's yeah, that's I'll, what I'm I scare doing myself now. in it. You know, yeah. I'm just using like a third throttle. Yeah. You know, that's all you need. It, it, it's swift. It's nice. It's very predictable. It's a lovely car, it really is. And it grips. It doesn't sound like I thought it would. That's the one thing that's really surprised me. Like, Because it's straight six, well, I know the straight six sound, and it doesn't, it's not obscenely loud at all. Like you absolutely, I'd go cruising in this car. Like to go across Europe might be, be awesome. Yeah, well, I mean, yeah, it, it is at the end of the day. Unlike the other sort of straight six car, this, you know, a GTR is a race car for the road. I mean, this is a GT car. This was the market they were going after. I don't like Japanese cars of this era as well. The indicator stalk is on this side, which I actually really like. It takes you a minute to get used to it. You know, you try and indicate by washing the windscreen, but um, I really, really like it. You know what? Overall, I actually really, really like this car. Would I prefer it with a manual? Yes, of course I would. Because I think for me, having if I were to have a car like this, I want it as like a, a sporty thing. But I think you've got to be honest, you've got to be realistic like Jamie was, and you've got to say, how much am I gonna to have to pay to get a manual? I mean you said you looked at some manuals for the same money and they were not. Yeah, the, well, not I, nice cars. with any car it's always by the best example you can find, and this definitely was. I looked at some ropey manuals and manuals that have done twice the mileage of this, and I know they were alright. When this one came up, I, you know, I looked underneath it. I looked, and the, you know, it was just, it was amazing. So I thought, well, I'm going to take a punt. I'll go with the automatic. 
and yeah, I haven't really looked back. I think, I think you've done well. Plus, as we were saying earlier, I would rather take a car that was a genuine twin turbo. Or just, it's intake noise, that's what you get when you put your foot down, a lot of intake. I'd rather take a car that was a genuine twin turbo, but an auto, and then convert that to manual, rather than taking a manual NA and, and trying to turbo that, because... They're actually a different engine. Yeah. Well, they're, they're a 2 JZ, but the, the differences are so much that... Um, you're gonna have to just swap the engine you're out, You're gonna have to swap the engine out anyway. Yeah, is the automatic a bad box? No, actually, for the time, this is actually a pretty decent box. It's great. And it also does a pretty decent job if you just switch it out of manual mode and let it do its own thing. It's actually very good because of the way the engine is. And that's a big, like, asterisk there. The way this engine is in this car, it actually works very, very well with the Autobot. No, it's, this is not at all the car that I thought it was going to be. I was expecting a car that's going to be, like, egging you on and be like, no, go, 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 go. And, it, you know, a car that wouldn't be very happy being at like lower RPM stuff. Actually, I find this instance it's happiest at lower RPM doing that sort of stuff. But, like you say, unlike a Civic Type R, because it's got that torque low down, you can still make really nice swift progress without ringing his neck. But yeah, I really quite like the Supra. I still think in my dream garage I'll have a GT4. <laughs> that's just me. That, that's just, I don't know, there's something about them because I always like the Castrol Tom's one obviously yeah. and that's actually got the sleeker engine in it so I'm kind of like actually I'd kind of be more original but this is this is cool I can see where you got it like it's just yeah there's nothing else like it is there no no not quite. and that's something in, in an increasing world of kind of almost interchangeable European and German in particular cars I really trying to celebrate and that's something I like about I've currently got the FK8 Civic on my driveway and that's something I really like about that that like that couldn't be anything else like you're never mistaking that car no, for anything no, no. else and this has that so well, interestingly actually the only th car you'd ever mistake this for coming the other way is possibly a Celica GT4 yeah because they look slightly similar. Yeah, if you had the big the big wing on the back and yeah. stuff, and yeah, you weren't super familiar with them, you'd be like, yeah, yeah. okay, it's kind of, but... Um, or a Mitsubishi FTO. I've always thought they looked like Mini Supras. Oh, yeah, yeah. Fortunately, those appeared or just vanished. <laughs> like, I, when's the last time you saw one of them? On the road, not like on someone's driveway that's clearly yeah. been there no, since no, like 2005. Right. Thank, thank you for bringing this down. This is a really, really nice car. It's, yeah, not what I expected, but... That's why I love doing YouTube, because I'm constantly getting these pleasant surprises. Yeah. Thanks for watching, everybody. Please like, comment, subscribe, do all the things that you do, and we will hopefully see you on the next one. Bye-bye. Oh, beware the Morris dancers.